Good morning, Crossbridge Church. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday morning. We're so happy that you're here. In a moment, we're going to hear from Pastor Sam as we continue our current series called Romans. But before we get into that, we do have a few announcements, starting off with Youth Camp, which is happening July 25th through the 30th. If you want more information about that, go ahead and hit up Kevin at his email at kevin at crossbridgemiami.com. We also have some house parties happening, also kicking off in July, and it's going to be so much fun, a time of fellowship, to get together with friends. It's something we weren't able to do last year, but we're able to do this year together. We have several lined up. If you want more information about dates and times about that, don't forget to download our app. More information will be on there. And church, that is all for today. So now let us worship together. I sing praises to your name Praises to your name The name that's so much higher than all names And all of Together, be lifted up. Be lifted up. Be lifted higher. Be lifted up. Be lifted higher. I sing praise. Let's sing.
Your name is hope inside me, hope inside me. Your name is love. I love that always finds me, always finds me. Your name. Your name.
only you can do It changes us, it changes what we see And what we see When you come in the room When you do what only you can do It changes us, it changes what we see And what we see Imagine you're in a situation where maybe somebody close to you, maybe, maybe just a phone call away, uh, maybe a close relative, and um, they won't speak to you and you won't speak to them. Maybe you had a falling out with your father. Maybe you had a falling out with your mother. And you never really got around to reconciling that relationship, and this, is, this has been going on for years. But now you've got kids of your own, and they've grown up in this this tragic pattern has repeated itself. Now, there's a falling out between you and them. And the whole time you're thinking, this is, something's totally off, horribly off. Something's wrong with this whole picture. 
Nobody's supposed to live life this way. And while we're just imagining here, the tragedy is there's a lot of people who live life exactly this way. And the greater tragedy is there's a lot of people in the world that live exactly this way in relation to God. And today we find ourselves at the center of Romans, Romans chapter 5. And Paul's going to talk about a reconciliation to end all reconciliations. We're in episode 6 of our summer series. And hopefully we'll learn that we're all saved from this tragic pattern that we're all trapped under because of our relationship to Adam but also how through faith we're set free and we find ourselves at the center of an ancient promise in a relationship with the creator God himself. So if you're watching us from YouTube or Facebook, go ahead and like and share the service with your friends. And if you have a Bible, why don't you go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I'll be reading from verses 12 through 21. Here's what God's word says to us today. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, And death reigned through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift, the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous." The law, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul is just flowing out of the first half of this this chapter where we learned last week that we receive certain benefits by being justified through faith. In Jesus, we have peace with God. We have access to grace. We have a hope of a future a, a glory. And now he's telling us why this justification comes by making a comparison between two Adams. The first Adam we should all be acquainted of. We should all know he's the, the Adam of the Garden of Eden, the Adam of the fall. And the second Adam, he says here's the Adam From heaven is the Adam of the cross, Jesus Christ. And he he compares the two in order to understand what Jesus has done for us a little better. Because sometimes in order to understand something a little better, you need to compare it side by side with something like it, but not exactly like it. For example, if I uh, told you to look at my dog and describe my dog, you might say, well, your dog is white, he's pretty big, he's got a a white tail, white paws, brown eyes. He's got a slight beige tinge in his ears. But if I bring over my neighbor's dog and I say, well, now tell me what's the difference, you might say, well, you know, your dog's temperament is different, the thickness of his nose, the length of his hair. So in order for us to understand something and see something, Sometimes we got to see it alongside, alongside something like it, but different. And this is what Paul means here when he says that the first Adam is a type. The first Adam is a pattern. The first Adam is a prefiguring, a foreshadowing of the one to come. In order to see more clearly, in order for us to see more fully, in order for us to appreciate more deeply the work of Jesus and how Jesus has become the foundation of our justification. And he gives us a little road map to keep in mind as we travel through these truths. As he breaks up this last section of Romans 5 into, 
into three sections. The first section is two people are contrasted here. Notice in verses 12 through 14, he tells us, Adam sinned, death spread to humanity because all have sinned. So because of the first Adam, you got a, you got a chain reaction that just goes off here. Adam sins, and all of a sudden you've got the entrance of sin into the world. And as a result of that, you've got the entrance of death into the world. And as a result of that, you've got universal death that spreads to everybody because of sin. And so our problem, the problem of hu humanity, the problem of the human race, is not just that everybody sins individually in, 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 in a variety of different ways. is that somehow behind all of our sinning, there's this mysterious connection that we have with the first Adam whose sin has become our sin and whose judgment has become our judgment. This is what Paul is trying to explain when he says that in verse 14 that death reigned from Adam to Moses. That even though people didn't have God's law between that time period and even though people didn't explicitly break a particular law, yet they're all guilty because of what Adam did. Now that sounds strange. You might be asking, well wait a minute, that's that's not, that's not right. I feel bothered by that. I, 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 don't, think that's, I don't think that's right. I, I think that I, I, I agree with the famous theologian Billy Joel when he says we didn't start the fire. It was always burning. I, I, I don't agree with that. I find myself finding, make it make, make it make sense to me. Well, we all understand the idea of somebody representing us, right? If somebody represent you, represents you, um, their achievement or their loss means that you achieve or you lost either way because they're representing you. They represent you either in a court of law or they represent you because you voted for them. And you might say, oh, I get it now, but hold the phone. I didn't vote for Adam. I didn't vote for Adam to represent the union so he can go off and, and, and have the power of you know, collective bargaining to negotiate, and as a result, he's making a declaration of war with God. I would have never voted for that guy. But watch this. God did. And there's our problem. There's our rub that God did. God voted for Adam. God chose Adam, and nobody could choose a better representative for us, for you, as well as God could, right? Adam, right, in, God didn't just choose Adam. God created Adam, created the perfect representative that would act exactly as you would have acted if you and I would have been in that same situation. No one could ever say, I could have done a better job. I would have made a different choice. I would have, made a, uh, I would have chosen a better representative. No, you wouldn't have because that would be saying that you could have chosen somebody better than the choice that God made. Listen to how John Stott says it, and he summarizes it this way. He says, we cannot point the finger at Adam in self-righteous innocence, for we share in his guilt. And it is because we sinned in Adam that we die today. Adam, the first human being, sinned. And in him, all human beings sinned. And all human beings died. And all are condemned. And the fact that God deals with us and through us in this way, through our representative, is actually good news How's that good news? Well, this leads to this little roadmap that Paul is, is making for us to the second section that we, he, uh, we see here. He's not only contrasting two people, but he's contrasting two different paradigms. In verse 17, Paul says, If by one man's disobedience death reigned, then by one man's obedience much more, underline that, much more will those who receive grace will reign in life. Understand that if each and every one of us is able to represent ourselves, it will only lead us to death. We have no defense at all against God, right? But if Adam's disobedience is our disobedience then, right, if this is how God deals with humanity, then, then if only one man's perfect obedience, if only there was somebody who can obey God perfectly, if only there was somebody who can represent us in, in, in that light, you know, then, then that would be great, if God is dealing with humanity as, as, as a corporate entity. This is what theology you call a federal headship. It means that we have peace with God because our federal head, right, we have a covenant relationship through him. We can have, we can have the life that the first Adam and left to ourselves we can never enjoy. We have a federal head. This is how God deals with humanity. And you may ask, okay, I get it. Jesus is the second Adam, I understand. But how can... How can one man sacrifice, as noble as it is, how can I receive any of those benefits? How can one man's uh, act 
uh, change my current condition, secure my eternal future. Well, you got to compare them side by side. This is what Paul is doing. you got to begin to see the differences and the similarities. You'll begin to understand how Adam's choice to sin was based or an act, it was based on an act of self-righteousness versus Jesus' act here, right, to die was motivated by self-sacrifice. When you look at him side by side, Adam's choice to break the law was an act of self-righteousness versus Jesus' choice to fulfill the law was an act of true righteousness. Adam's uh, uh, choice resulted in death and condemnation versus Jesus' choice resulted in justification and in life. Under Adam's paradigm, everybody dies, right? Death reigns. We, we live in an old sinful kingdom where we're slaves to vices and sins. But watch this. In Jesus' paradigm, because of Jesus' kingship in his kingdom, we are kings and we are kings in the presence of God. And the biggest difference, I think, is that while Adam was told he would enjoy blessing after blessing after blessing if he obeyed God, Jesus was told he would face agony and pain and death if he obeyed God, yet he obeyed God perfectly and perfectly walked with his Father. They look alike. And there's some correspondence and similarities, but, but the positive side to Jesus right, is much more much more than an equalizer to the negative side to Adam. Jesus doesn't just equal everything out to zero. And it's not even that Jesus gives us a positive 10. Jesus gives us, in Paul's mind, I could imagine a positive 10,000. This is what he has in mind in this phrase, much more, much more. We have a much more of certainty because God's ultimate purpose is never judgment. God's ultimate purpose is to showcase the glory of his grace. Grace abounds the more. The ultimate purpose of God in creating and governing this world the way he does is so that he can display his abounding grace against the backdrop of judgment through Jesus to everyone who finds themselves in him. That's the meaning of history, by the way, that God's grace triumphs over many, 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 many transgressions, not just the one how, by providing a substitute righteousness for us in Jesus. John Gresham, the founder of uh, Westminster Seminary, writes this. He says, Adam, before he fell, was righteous in the sight of God. But he was still under the possibility of becoming unrighteous. Those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ not only are righteous in the sight of God, but they are Beyond the possibility of becoming unrighteous to God. That's such great news. In their case, our case, the probation is over because Christ has stood it for them. I'm so thankful. I am so thankful for the active obedience of Jesus on my behalf because without it, church, there is no hope. There's absolutely no hope. I choose Jesus to represent me. I choose him to represent me because I know that in him, one day I'm going to rule, uh, I'm going to move uh, rather towards uh, uh, or from being ruled by death to becoming a ruler in life. It's almost too good to be true, but church, if you believe it today, if you trust in this promise today, if you humbly rest in it today, this truth of one day reigning and ruling in life like a king and like a queen in the presence of the almighty creator these are the moments or these are the realities. These are the promises that's going to sustain you when frustrations come. These are the promises that are going to sustain you when heartaches come and the pain comes in this present life. Which leads us to the last thing we see here in Paul's little road map. Two people contrasted, two paradigms contrasted. And now he's contrasting two possibilities, two realities. We learned already from last week or a couple weeks ago. And Paul reiterates here in verse 20 that the job of the law was to expose sin. The law comes into our lives and it just kind of brings this dormant sin that we don't even know we have. It just brings it out, exposes it for us to see. But sin, here's the best part, sin doesn't have the last word because he says where sin abounds, grace super abounds. At the cross we see the worst that sin can do. At the cross we see the worst that it can do. Adam even Adam's sin is not the last word. 
And as humanity, which we're a part of, we crucified the Lord. But at the cross, we see that even the worst of it can never change. It can never stop God's plan to rescue and save us. At the cross, grace overwhelmed and li- uh, sin and life triumphs over death. The second Adam, Jesus, perfectly obeys the Father. The perfectly obedient federal head is the last word for us. There's no hope at all without him. And at the same time, there is certain hope with and in him. And as a church, we need to remember. We need to remember that while the gospel tells us that we are more sinful than we can imagine and that we're, you know, the fallout between us and the heavenly father is actually more tragic than than we can ever imagine that required, it required punishment that at the same time God is so gracious that in Jesus our sins are dealt with, that in Christ we are more accepted than we could ever dream and we could ever hope for. To forget these two realities To forget these two possibilities will only ever lead to moralism and erase any joy that we're ever going to find in the gospel. This is what drove our early church fathers to to sometimes describe that this belief of justification by faith is always crucified between two heresies. Because without a knowledge of our sin, without knowing, right, that the payment of the gospel is trivial and it won't have any power to to transform and change us. But without a knowledge of Jesus' complete debt-satisfying life and death, the knowledge of sin would crush us. The knowledge of sin would leave us to deny that sin is even, you know, that sin is even even real. And what we end up doing, as a result of that, we end up suppressing it. Let me ask you something. How precious is Jesus' active obedience for you? If our condemnation at its root comes from what Adam did, our representative, then the root of our justification doesn't come from what we do, but it comes from what Christ did. And here's the mind-blowing part. This thing was planned from before the very beginning. As Peter would write in his letter when he says this, he says, he says but with the precious blood of Christ... As of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. If you believe that, if you believe that you won't believe that you got to earn your righteousness, you won't believe that you don't need perfect righteousness, you'll just accept God's righteousness. If you believe that today, if you believe that Jesus is your representative, you won't believe that people can't change or that people don't need to change. You believe that people can be changed by the power of the gospel, but there's no quick fixes. If you believe this promise, you won't go into guilt. You won't go into shame trying to to change those things by your efforts. You won't go away from it or you won't convince yourself, hey, everything's okay when it's really not. But rather... You're going to rest in Jesus, and you're going to go through the rough moments. So let us spend some time this week, church, praying and thinking about an area in your life, an area in your community, an area in our world where we see the brokenness of sin. And what would that area look like if grace reigned instead of death? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we we, we come to reflect on your plan of salvation. We ask that you consider our our own sinfulness. And as we consider your gift of grace where, where our sins have been forgiven and our debt has been paid, we stand today or we sit today in awe and wonder and in praise for your goodness. We thank you that Christ's own resurrected life has been breathed into ours and that we are we're clothed in his own perfect righteousness. We're, we're amazed at your loving kindness and we pray that we live in your praise and in your glory. Father, we thank you that the more that our sin is revealed and exposed, the more we realize what amazing grace has been given to us and on all who have trusted Christ for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hey, friends, thank you for watching. Uh, Go ahead and subscribe and follow this channel uh, so you don't miss a single video or live stream. 
Go ahead and share this video with friends. And remember, uh, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.